really all you want to focus on is like, okay, what's the simplest version of this to keep them from saying no, from wanting them to go talk to their wife or their partner or schedule another meeting or let the committee decide or ask for a proposal, like whatever that next step is, they most likely will say no to most things they see. Your job should be like, can I get them to stay interested long enough to get more info? <laughs> Well, hello, Brian. It's great hey. to have you with us today. Oh, I am excited. I know Johnny and I really enjoyed your book, Three Minute Rule. And yeah. we found that in this month's theme, leadership, pitching your ideas is such an important skill set. Yeah. And I know a lot of us, when we think about pitching, we get very nervous. Yeah. And I think the idea that the word pitching sort of invokes the idea that you're like, uh, you're a sales guy or something. It's like, Anytime you try to influence anybody to do anything, anytime you want to convince someone of your way of thinking, like that's a pitch effectively. And that's, you're, you're trying to convey information for the, for the betterment of your process. And that's, you do that every day, you're trying to convince your wife or your girlfriend where to go to dinner, or trying to do anything with your brother-in-law or family. Like that's all pitching and presenting. It all sort of wraps up in the same thing. And a lot of us, when we think about pitching, we think about PowerPoints and Ooh. data and Boom. all this information. Yeah. And what we love about the book, and we're gonna dive into it, is how simplifying it, getting it concise and getting that information shareable yeah. is really the name of the game. Yeah, and it's like, it's, it's even less about the idea of making it short. It's more about showcasing the idea that you can simplify the information. And in today's world where everybody's trying to shout louder and mm -hmm. say more and get bigger, it's like somebody who can simplify their information and let it stand on their own. Like it's, that's loud. Like people are drawn to that. That that's where the, that's the new sexy simple is the new sexy. I say, you know, like clarity is compelling. You want people to be drawn to you. You don't have to say very much. Well, it's also in our nature to expand everything and bring all this data points in it. And, I know that even in going through this and reading it, I had to remind myself several times that that I've known to cut things down, but it's just, an, I think it's just natural in us to, to just cram as much in yeah. it. Oh yeah. Also, uh, as for somebody who's, who's done some editing, whether it be for audio or for video, um, there's so many pieces that you're able to cut out and still get the same effect yeah. across. I mean, have you ever watched the director's cut of a movie and thought, oh, wow, thank goodness those extra scenes were in there, right? Like, there's a reason because you get partial to your information. You get precious. And then you can't understand the process of somebody new taking in the information beat by beat and piece by piece. And I, I struggled with this in my own book. The guy who wrote the book on this, like my yeah. intro was supposed to be four pages long, three minutes to read. And my first pass at it was nine and a half pages long. And it was because I had just written the book and I felt so excited. And when I wrote the intro, it was so clever and I wordsmithed it so beautifully. And I was like, you know what? Maybe, maybe my intro is the one thing in my entire history that could be longer than three minutes. And it's like, no. And I literally had to go back to the very beginning and start my exercises and do my post-it notes to get that intro down to the proper three minutes. And it's just, it's not easy when you know your information so well and you kind of fall in love with it. Yeah. You're too close to the problem. Yeah. And of course, we talk about this all the time. Social media is shortening our attention mm -hmm. space. Yes. So yeah. probably the next version of the book's going to be 90 seconds. <laughs> exactly. Right? Like, Everybody's already in the two minute rule now. So they've already got it right now. Well, it, it, and if it's not already on blink is it's getting reduced to a yeah. 15 uh, minute bite uh, as, as well as that. I mean, just to, to let our audience know how effective your pitches are in doing research for this show. I had noticed that over the last few months, you have carpet bombed YouTube <laughs> with so many podcasts with the book only to vindicate and show your skills in a great pitch because yeah. you were able to get it out there and you're on the show. Yeah. Well, yeah I, and this is the, the pitch. Works. <laughs> yeah. The pitch works. Well, and listen, it's like, that's part of the point as well is like, that was easier for me because I knew the audience, right? Yeah. Like how many times do you guys get pitched stuff for people to come on the show? Oh, and it's like every day. six pages of, you know, details and reasons. And you're like, Oh my God, like, what are you talking about? Whereas when I worked with my publicist, it was like, well, let's just get it down to a very simple, mm -hmm. here's a video. If you want to be here, here's the email. It's like, it was so simple and clean that I think people were like, Whoa, like, maybe this guy's got something to offer. If he's not trying to sell us on him, like maybe there's something there. So, and that is 
really where the world is today. And I, I have this sort of, ex I know I do this thing on stage where I talk about how Niagara Falls froze over at the turn of the century. Mm -hmm. And there was 5,000 residents in, in Niagara at the time. And they were woken out of their sleep at three in the morning because the falls stopped running. And the noise of the rushing water and the torrent of rapids going over there had created such noise that they became used to it. And they just tuned it out, right? But when it stopped, it was the loudest sound they had heard in years. And what you'll find out there in the world today is that the marketing and the media and the social media and the promotion and the clickbait is a raging rapid of information <laughs> that people have just tuned out. And when you find a way to say things in the simplest way that, that clearly you're not overselling or overstating, people are just jarred. They're just like, whoa, like you must have something going on because you're not like promising me ridiculous things to try to hook me and try to capture my attention. You're just giving me the information. The information must be good. And it allows the person receiving the pitch to think for themselves. Yeah, mm -hmm. which they're gonna do anyways. Like the world is not like it used to, you know, it's like if I was trying to sell you this mug before and I would tell you it was like shatter resistant to uh, 9,000 degrees and 4,000 PSI of pressure, you had to decide if you believed me, right? Cause what are you gonna do? You know, go down to the library and grab the encyclopedia and do some research tests on it. Like, no, I had to believe you now. It's like, I go on Google in two seconds and be like a uh, PSI thing of a mug. And you'd be like, yeah, this mug is not capable of doing that. Yeah. And there's four of them that are cheaper. So it just makes so much sense now to let your audience make their decisions. No one's going to let you sell them. No one is going to let you sell them anything. No one's going to let you sell. That's it. No one's buying anything if you're trying to sell it to them. And in an industry like Hollywood, where yeah. it feels like they're now making TV shows about everything. Yes. And the pitching is just anyone can walk in now with reality television. Before, yeah. there was a select few You were in, in, the, in the guard gate with the moat. You, right. you, if you were in the castle, you got to do it. And we get pitched constantly to, to go on reality TV yeah. and do all these shows. Cutting through the noise in Hollywood yeah. and staying relevant is a huge challenge. Very, very difficult. And obviously, a lot of what you see now is like one great idea and then seven other spin-offs of those ideas. Yes, I've done that myself. <laughs> exactly. So how was your Hollywood journey and how much did reality television change things for you? You know, what Hollywood taught me was that the idea that you could like personality your way through and, and hey, yeah, let's do lunch, like good seeing you. Like the image of that, you realize really quickly that that's worth nothing. Like the network president will have heard, you know, a thousand pitches a year. And there was a, it was a great story when I was in CBS about to pitch and out of the room walked Simon Cowell. And I was like, oh, damn it, I have to follow Simon Cowell into a pitch meeting. This sucks. And as we were talking, he kind of looked over my shoulder and was like smiling. And I turned around and there's Mark Burnett had just walked in. And I realized like, oh my God, I'm like, Mark Burnett's gonna be coming in after me. I'm wedged between Simon Cowell and Mark Burnett, right? And I'm like, oh my God. And I got this sort of wave of panic of, what am I gonna say? Like, how am I gonna be interesting or dynamic? Like what sort of snappy snap stories are gonna impress these people? Like none, I'm gonna look like a fool. <laughs> and so I remember thinking like, I gotta get out of this room. Like I gotta get in here and get out of here as fast as I can. And I just walked in and I was just like, okay, here's the idea. Here's why I think it works. Here's why I think it works for CBS. And here's how we're gonna produce it. And that was it. It was like a nine minute meeting and I was out. They bought the show and I remember thinking like, ooh, that went over really well. Like I like that energy. I gotta do that some more. And so I started developing that system where I would just really focus on the idea, pitch the idea with passion and like let that sit on its own. And then the next thing you know, I'm getting this reputation. My agents call me like, yeah, people like, you're the best pitcher in town. I'm like, I'm not doing a lot. Like. There's no magic tricks, no smoke and mirrors. Like I don't have any lines. I don't have any closing ideas. I don't have any special elevator pitch techniques. It's just like, I'm just really good at explaining what an idea is so that you understand what the idea is. You probably aren't gonna buy it because that's what TV's like. Everybody says no, but at least they understood the idea. Right. And that I found so much more rewarding. And then when I started teaching that to other industries and other people and CEOs and stuff, I realized like that's all they're looking for. They just want people to understand their idea the same way they do. And I, well, to go along with that, the more data, the more facts you're putting in, the more information you're filling this up, I think I, 
also takes away from your ability to be passionate about the project because yeah. you're trying to get all these data points across. Yeah, and, and that's a big mistake I see people make is there's two sort of forms of information. There's the information, the value, and then there's the engagement. And you can only engage with somebody meaningfully after you've made a decision based on their information. First, you gotta conceptualize the idea. Okay, what is it and how does it work? Then you gotta contextualize the ideas like, okay, how does that work for me? Is it real? Does this actually work? And then you gotta actualize it, meaning like, okay, I actually wanna find out more. I wanna get a little bit deeper. I need to talk to my wife. I gotta get, bring a board meeting. Like whatever it is that that next stage is, but like you can't have these in-depth engaged conversations with someone until they get those three sort of value pieces in. So they understand the basics of it. Now they want to get nuanced. And that's why you can use a three minute rule, make a great pitch and then still have an hour meeting. That's fine. But the first three minutes is what counts because <laughs> they're already making their decision. And sometimes as you guys, I mean, listen, you're shaking your head. You know it. Mm -hmm. Somebody's want, come to pitch you something and you've already decided in the first 15 seconds if it's a yes or no. Absolutely. And that's like, that's because we focus so intensely now and so efficiently with our short attention spans. It's like, if I give you my attention, I want valuable information right now, not giving it to me, bang, I'm out. And, I, and I'll make my decision. Like, I don't want to deal with this. So really the three minute rule is like, can you extend someone's decision-making process before that? Yes or no to maybe three minutes. If you do it really well, it's like, you got to do it. Well, you got to tell a great story. You got to lead people. And if you do it right, you can, you could get three minutes. I mean, we're, and to go along with that, I mean, even the advertisements on YouTube that you have to grab attention in five seconds. Yeah. That's all. And you how many times have you clicked? Like you won't even wait to five seconds. You're like, click, 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 you know, cause they're trying to sell you something. Mm -hmm. Whereas I always joke on, on stage, I'll have the picture of the Titanic and it's like, James Cameron put you in a seat for three hours <laughs> to watch a movie about a boat that you know, right, sinks. we knew the ending. Okay. <laughs> And that's because when you're telling a story, when you're leading your, in, your information, when you're leading your, you're informing and leading your audience, right? You're building to this conclusion and advertising has always done the state and prove I'm going to mm -hmm. state something really awesome. And then I'll prove to you how I'm going to give it to you. And that was fine. If we had time machines, we could go back to the sixties and seventies <laughs> that might still work. But today it's like you make any kind of claim or promise. The first thing people think of is like, this is bullshit right away. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's, it's in our nature now. And I, I well, can't not, even talk about clickbait because nobody even falls for clickbait anymore. You said this whole <laughs> thing in my, in my keynote speech about clickbait. And I had to change the whole thing because no one falls for it the way they used to. Well, to go along with that, I mean, even if you hear a claim, your automatic response is to Google it and yes. see if it's true. That's right. <laughs> I mean, it's right there. You're yeah. not really, you don't have much work to do. No. And it's like, so making these big proclamations the way advertising is done just has negative effects now. And it says a lot about you and it, and it, this is why you're pitching while you're trying to explain your valuable information, your audience is poking holes in it and judging you and wondering if that's even true. And like it colors everything and it's just not needed anymore. Now we're not here to bash short attention spans. No. And there are some good adaptive qualities around these short attention yeah. spans that you speak to in the book. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, I think what happens is, is that like I said, like we actually aren't mindless zombies with these like distracted easily. It's actually, we just want to do it efficiently. If I, if I give you attention, I want my information that I want. I want what I want. I want to be entertained. I want to be informed. I want to know what it is I came for. And that actually provides some tremendous opportunities because now it's not about your personality. It's not about the tie you wear. It's not about your neuro linguistic programming. And I actually have better time with clients that are introverted. The extroverts like me, with personality, like a big personality are pain in the ass because like, they want to play that. Game. They want to play that game. And, but it's even more than that. They, they'll use that as a crutch. They'll use that as a defense or as a shortcut if they don't have the information right. And it's like what I used to do if I couldn't quite get a pitch right with a TV show and I would, it'd be more like, oh, it's in the casting. Oh, we'll, we'll figure out the casting. Or I'd do a challenge based show and I really couldn't come up with a great challenge to really illustrate it. I'd still go pitch it anyways and just be kind of like, yeah, we'll get challenge producers to figure it out, right? And because I have a, a big sort of personality, I can, I used to try to power through that. And so I'll meet, I'll work with CEOs that are big personalities and they'll try to power through. And it's like, no, back up. Like the reason why you have to put on a show is because you don't have the goods. It's like, and you think your show actually wins you something. It doesn't. The goods are really what you want to talk value. Somebody has the goods. I, 
I have biotech scientists who literally could put you to sleep if you let them talk to you for more than 10 minutes. But when they put out their information in, in this format, it's like, whoa, it sounds so great because they're, they're not trying to do anything else. Just give you the goods. And that's what our society wants. And it's a huge opportunity. And how did the three minute rule come across for you? Like, how did this come about? You know, I just, I was, I got asked to work with an oil and gas company and the, it was an investment bank guy. Sounds said, exciting. Yeah. And he said, Hey, can you help my clients do what you do? And I was like, no, I can't help anybody sell reality TV shows. He's like, no, I want you to help my clients pitch their ideas without putting people to sleep without ruining it. And so I went down to Florida and met with his client. It was the worst thing I'd ever seen. I can't believe this <laughs> poor guy was in front of these sort of like 18 to 20 of these institutional investors and family offices. And, and he was trying to explain why his oil and gas company is some you'd want to invest in or buy his stock. And it was a disaster and it was like awful and embarrassing and painful. And, and so when I worked with him to be like, Hey, you know, you, you might want to reorder your information and change this. And I, I just looked at it and broke it down. Like I would a TV show. And he left me this voicemail and he, and he was emotional and his voice was cracking and he was just like, you changed my life. I used to be so miserable having to go on the road. Now I'm excited to meet people. The stock's up. My wife thinks you put something in my drink. Like <laughs> I'll, I'll never forget what you've done for me. And I was just like, what the hell? Like no network president has ever said anything <laughs> like that. Not even close. And I always make the joke. Like I'm sort I'm really close to being a caveman. So my ego is just like, Ooh, mm, Brent like that. We want more people to say nice things. And so I found like if I worked with people in other companies, they would be like so appreciative and it, I could see, I could see it changing right in front of them. And if you, you know, if you make an investment banker some money, like you got a lot of friends, like they had more than enough clients from that point on. And I just realized like, Oh man, this is what I want to do. I just want to, there's something freeing. I can see the frustration in people's face when they love their idea and they know what they're doing and they have a great product, business or service, but they just can't make other people understand it. And it's just like, it's, it's been really cool for me. They get in their own way. Oh my God. Do they get in their own way? And yeah. what I love about the post-it notes and the idea of reducing it down, distilling it down to something that people can actually share with other people. Right. right? That's yeah. the key to all of this. It's like, if you're just going to fill it with jargon, and only a small select group of scientists can even follow along. Yeah. Well, those scientists are gonna go share it with their neighbor, share it with the investor right. and find you that opportunity. That's right. So the game of telephone is, is also important when yeah. we're pitching our ideas. Yeah, and it forces you, right? Like when, when I do the bullet point exercises and I'll do it in my workshops or whatever, but it's like, it forces you to just use simple bullet points, points and a couple of phrases. And you give somebody those, they don't know who you are, they don't know what your business is and they pitch it back to you like pretty close. You're like, what the hell? And even in the book, like I do where I take one of my clients and it's a plumbing company and it's like, here's his 30 bullet points. Like, I bet you could tell me what his company does and why it's valuable. And you can, or I, or I give people a, like 20 bullet points from a TV show and you have no idea what the show is. And then you, you're pitching it back. And it's like, you could have said that in the network and that would tell them exactly all you need. And it's very revealing when you see how much information is just contained in those bullet points. Cause the story you want to tell from a to Z does not need every letter in the alphabet. Well, that was the story of extreme makeover. That was so yeah. compelling was here you are in the room. All these ideas are swirling. Everyone's yelling at each other yeah. and you had this Eureka moment and you're like, you know what? I just give me five minutes. That's right. <laughs> just give me five just minutes in the world of pitching. I'm sure that's like, what are you talking about? Yeah. And it was like, minutes. I'm driving up there right now. Like you just got, just let me in the office. And I, and I, I remember pulling the bullet points off the board being like, these are the only ones I need. This is it. This is the whole show. It's, it's, we're going to follow them for a year. They're big, bigger, bigger than the biggest loser contestants. It's the biggest transformation. Like I didn't need to go into all the nuances and sell it. And that was the first time I really noticed that piece come to life, which is like, Oh, if I simplify this, like I could actually convey the value more effectively. And there's an implicit trust that one, the listener is going to follow along yep. and two, that the team behind them can produce this thing. Yeah. Right? Like you don't need to spell it out. No, like these are the scales out. we're going to use and this is the personal right. trainer we're going to use and here's how we're going to fly them. They can figure all that yeah, out. And by the way, we had to have those conversations, but that was later. Like when they were actually into the show and like wanted it, uh, they, they, they bought into the concept. They knew how we were going to do it. They, they figured how it was going to work for ABC. And then it's like, okay, now let's talk about how we produce this. And like that engagement stuff comes later. Like that's fine but you just got to get it in the first three minutes and a bunch of brains in a room can figure those things out easily once they're all on board yes 
Yeah, and that's people will then engage with you from a place of desire. Like mm -hmm. they'll want yeah. it to work out. They'll want your conclusion. And it's the same way when I talk about if you watch a TV show or like a CSI or something, like you know how it's gonna end. <laughs> it ends the same every single week, but you want it to end that way because you've gone through the journey. The information has led you and now their conclusion is your conclusion. That's what you want. You don't want the bad guy to win because that's not the way the story's told. And you can do that with your business or product or service or whatever. It's like you can lead people to that moment. And I always say like, never start with the hook of your story. Bar Rescue is a perfect example where it's like, I didn't walk into the room and say, hey, John Taffer <laughs> is the Gordon Ramsay of bars and restaurants. It's like, people would have been like, he is? All right, well, let's hear him. Let's talk about it. Like it would have been, Ugh. you know? Whereas I went through, it was like, here's the show. Here's the way we're gonna produce it. You know, here's what John has done. Here's his history. Here's a little tape on him. And so the network president literally said in the room, oh, so he's like our Gordon Ramsay <laughs> for bars and nightclubs. I love that. And you're like, that's right. And let me ask you this. I, when I heard that, my first thought was, if you present it in that manner, they have a picture of, of what, how they view Gordon Ramsay. Right. So if John is anything other than that, in his yes. own way, it doesn't work for them. That's so right. they're like, no, well, he's not. Right. But if you let them put it together, it's... It, it becomes... They, they're looking for that conclusion as well. Like they're following your information, looking for the ending. And so all you can do is lead them to the ending you want, mm -hmm. that conclusion, then you're all on the same page. Well, you mentioned earlier the state then prove model. Right. Can you break that down for our audience who's not familiar with it? Yeah. And, and so, why it doesn't work any longer. Yeah, so think about it like an elevator pitch, right? Like what do we used to think about of an elevator pitch or how we've been taught? Is I see you in an elevator and it's like I lean in and go, I have an investment that can make you 10 times your money <laughs> by the end of the year. What do you think? And the guy goes and leans in and goes, ooh, tell me more, right? And it's like, is that the way that goes now? Like, no, yeah. right? Somebody leans in and says something like that, you're like, oh God, leaning out going like, this guy's full of crap. Now, he might even have that, but the point is, is like now that he's stated it, and now he's gonna try to prove it to you, in today's world, in the hypersensitive consumer and the hypersensitive audience, they're met with skepticism and disbelief. You, you can't get away from that. The years of bombardment of total crap marketing and over the top has ruined it for us. So there is no more of that. So by stating and proving, you end up telling your audience what's gonna happen. Like, I've got a big claim, now I'm gonna try to prove it to you. They already think it's not true. Not a very good place to start. And that's why I teach informing and leading. Let the information start and then lead them to that statement, that grand statement, because they might get to the point where they go like, oh wow, I could probably make like 10 times my money, maybe even by the end of the year. And you're like, yeah, that's right. That's basically what I was trying to get you to, to understand. So, and that's why advertising and Madison Avenue and those guys have had so much trouble because they're slower to come around because in their mind, the 30 seconds, it's always been like, I gotta grab you with something big and then I try to tell you. But now it's like, well, 30 seconds is a bloody eternity on if you're watching an ad or a YouTube video commercial. So there's lots of time to get your information out. Well, it, what's interesting about that, and even in for the psychological work that we're doing in our programs, if, if there is a cognitive process that's flawed, say that there's a, a cognitive distortion that's holding them to have a belief about themselves that is just wrong, yeah. you can't point that out directly because they start to rationalize why you're wrong. Exactly. Whereas we start asking them questions about the why they think that way. Right. They'll always get to the conclusion that, oh wait, what I'm saying is wrong. Right. And then they can start unweaving and untangling their own, own cognitive sources. Yes, and that's why I say like, it, you guys might not think about what you do as a pitch to clients, but it's like, it kinda is, because you mm -hmm. have, you kind of have the solution for them. Mm -hmm. And if you come out and be like, here's your solution. And then they go, oh, I don't like that solution. And then you're trying to prove it to them. It's like they're resistant. But if you walk them through, you'll get there. And it's funny, like I wrote a, I wrote a Forbes article about how politicians should be taking lessons from entrepreneurs right now because <laughs> the way they're yapping is ridiculous. And I work I agree. presidential client candidate and I was just like, oh, wow, this is really hard to get you to understand. Like everybody's heard this stuff before. You're not winning any points. And if you watch the impeachment hearing, it's like, man, if either one, if either side hired me, like that would be the winning side. Cause what people want right now is for someone to get up there and be just like, just lay out the simple facts. I don't need your, mm -hmm. all this, like it's just crap. It's, just, it's yeah. amazing, right? 
And it's like, uh, if just one person got up there and just got to the damn point and just said simply, like simply, it would be like, it would be the loudest thing you'd heard. It would be the one thing that everybody remembered. Well, we're all kind of hoping that the media will do that, but no, it's not happening. That's not what they do. Right. They're capturing <laughs> sound bites and they like the conflict. Yes. But that, they, they don't want Those are people that watch. Conflict causes ratings. Mm. Conflict will get you to write political donations. Oh, we, <laughs> nothing else matters. We are well aware of that. Yeah, yeah. A lot of the pitches matters. they try to drag us into are like, imagine. hey, let's get some conflict. We're like, yeah. that's not what we do. That's not what we do. We transform people. We yeah. don't want conflict. Yeah. But. I think the other key point in all of this that is hard for people to wrap their head around is just the simplification of it. Mm -hmm. And it's even when we try to teach social skills, it's like, oh, but that sounds so simple. It's like, but you're not doing it. Right. Yes, and this pitch sounds simple, but you're, you're not, not doing right, it. You're overcomplicating it. The simplicity requires like a complexity on its own. I always joke, like it's taken me 20 years to learn how to say things in three minutes. Mm -hmm. But the simplicity conveys a level of confidence exactly, and it goes both ways to get simplified. You need to have the confidence in your information. And if you are simplified in your information, it conveys that confidence. And I say like, if I was trying to cater your wedding and I had Gordon Ramsay to be the chef, how many words would I need to convince you of that? Right? Four. I have Gordon Ramsay. How would I walk in that room? How would our meeting go? Would my chest be like sunken and slow? Like, or would I big smile on my face? And you know, like I'd have a level of confidence because all I need to say is, hey, I got Gordon Ramsay, right? And it means I'm, I'm not using a lot of words. I'm not trying to sell you on it. Now, if you look at a different way, let's say it was my brother-in-law who was an ex-convict who just got out of prison, didn't really cook very much, but really needed a job. How many words would I need to sell you on that, right? And how is my confidence gonna be different? And I'm gonna be trying to sell you and you as the audience are going to pick up on that. You're gonna pick up on my need and my desperation. You're gonna pick up on my body language. You're gonna pick up on the words I use because I'm using a lot trying to sell you. And so what I try to get people to understand is that whatever you're trying to convey to somebody else has value somewhere on the scale between Gordon Ramsay and my brother-in-law ex-convict. And the more words you use will show your audience where you fit on the scale. And so when you learn to basically say less, you actually show your audience that you have more competence and that is compelling to people. And it's, and it's real. It's not like phony bravado, right? It's like what I'm about to explain to you is good enough that I just need to explain it to you. Nothing else like that just cuts through like a knife today. And it's saying, hey audience, I know you're smart enough to put this together. Right. I don't need to explain it to you. That's right. You're smart. You're smart. You're and gonna it's get good. this. And I'm excited to share this that's with right. you. And it's that good. Because if it wasn't that good, I'd be trying to sell you on it. Because that's what you've learned is that people who are trying to sell you crap will just endlessly try to sell you crap. They will try to develop closing techniques and they will, you know, objection techniques, how to get over these things. like. Yeah, we know all those things. It's not going to help. If you use my name over and over again in a sales pitch, like it's not helping you. And we used to teach people that. Oh yeah. Like, could you imagine doing that today? It's unbelievable. Well, it makes you cringe just yeah. sitting on the other side. Like, just please stop. Please stop. Please. You're oh treating my God. me like an idiot yeah. <laughs> and oh I don't God. like it. That's right. Now you're the idiot That's for right. treating me that way. That's right. I think there's something else to be said of, of when you keep it simple, it allows the other people to start to take action. And the more yeah. you complicate things or the more information that's going on, it's all of a sudden this, this project that you want me to buy in on sounds like a pain in the ass. Right. Yes. And now they're thinking about the simpler action. Like, what am I going to have for lunch? Right. Oh, I had to pick my daughter <laughs> up from high school. Yeah. Okay. Like that's yeah. what they're thinking about. They're not like, Oh, let me string together this theory yeah. that you just put together. Yeah. Now, obviously the listeners are like, but my idea is complicated. <laughs> Three <laughs> minutes. It's I funny, can't I've never heard that before. It. Yeah. <laughs> Three minutes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like, uh, you know, like one of my clients has a type one diabetes anti-rejection therapy drug for the telemeters on your on your gene therapy stuff. Like, it's complicated. And they have the same idea where it's like, we have so much information. It's like, I, I know you do. And by the way, no investor is going to get in without all of that information. They are going to dig through this mm. like crazy. Yeah, it's called diligence but, yeah. after the pitch. <laughs> but all your and, and usually what I try to get people to understand is like, well, okay, what do you what is actually your objective? Like when you actually break down what your objective is, like I didn't go into a room 
with a network trying to get them to buy the show. I went into the room to try to get them to ask me questions about the show, to show interest. Cause that's like really all you can do because if they don't, they just go like, okay, got it. Thanks. We'll let you know if we're interested. Like, so when I, when I look at someone's objectives, like, are you getting them to like the person that you're in this meeting right now, are you, you think they have a checkbook with them and they're going to write a check in the, in the room? Like, you know, that doesn't happen very often anymore, right? Like that's not really a thing. The best case scenario is they go back to their office and say, Hey, Danny, I want you to do due diligence on mm -hmm. Evo Microtech or whatever, right? Like that's about it. Because then when they say, oh, why would we do that? Guess what? They have to regurgitate everything they've heard from <laughs> you. And I have an exercise where I have people take their favorite movie of all time. And no matter what they do, no matter how much they want to try to explain it, you can't get past three minutes. Like it, it that's it. That's all you have in there. Everything of value is about three minutes. So whatever you give to somebody in your meeting, when they go to explain to someone why they're interested, they might have three minutes. <laughs> right. So really all you want to focus on is like, okay, what's the simplest version of this to keep them from saying no, from wanting them to go talk to their wife or their partner or schedule another meeting or let the committee decide or ask for a proposal, like whatever that next step is, they most likely will say no to most things they see. Your job should be like, can I get them to stay interested long enough to get more info? So if you think your business is really complicated, that's fine. But the beginning and the opening of it doesn't have to be. We'll get to the complications later. And then those complications can be really valuable. They can be the thing that make people go, oh my God, like that's amazing. Like you can get people into that mode because they understand it the same way you do. And until they do that, it's, there's no value there. And the thing is, is this is not saying don't do your homework. This no. is not saying don't prepare, right? You hear oh, three it's, minutes. It's like, oh, okay. I'll just oh, waltz it, it, in way, tomorrow. I'm not kidding. It's not easy to do. Like, it's easier than you're probably making it at your listeners right now because they're probably making it super hard, but it's not just about making it shorter. It's about, okay, if I could extend somebody's decision-making process, what is the most valuable information I could have in there? If the black hole opens for a finite amount of time, how much stuff can I cram in there before it seals shut, right? And if you go through your information and I have a great, so I have good exercise, great exercise, depending on if you like it, <laughs> um, that show you how to take what you have and put them into statements of value, order them in the proper order in this whack order that I've created mm -hmm. so that you can see, okay, this is the order to lay it in. That's how your audience is going to make this decision. Now let's break that down because yeah. statements of value, I think is a really important concept introduced early in the book. And I think if you understand this, and we're going to go into whack next, you really can put this together in a yeah. way that changes your career that gives you more opportunity, whether you want to pitch in Hollywood or, yeah, Hey, brother. you got a great idea for your sing boss. It, sing it. There it is. You know? So yeah. what are these statements of value and how do we derive them from our idea? So after you've sort of broken it down into those bullet points that sort of give you all the ideas, and there's a couple of exercises that I use to really dive past your simple bullet points that you think of all the time, you really want to make those into statements. So it's like, if you're a personal trainer, your bullet point might be personal trainer. And then your statement of value may be like, I'm a personal trainer specializing in celebrities or specializing in those for the movies or whatever that is, right? Like you get a state, one statement that has a valuable piece of information in it. And then what you find is if you have those statements of value, you have a collection of them, then you can start to be like, like a puzzle. Okay. Well, what's the outside edges of the puzzle, you know, where you put first and what's the middle. And as I walk people through that system, you can see like now, and I have people do them on index cards or post-its where you can grab them and hold them and change them and cross them out and move them around in order. And you start to see it as a sort of a living, breathing entity that you can feel the flow, like, you know, almost like oceans in the wave. You can feel it building as you go through it and you see these statements in front of you. And that I found really powerful for people. So we have our idea yeah. and then we start writing down bullet points on post-it notes yep. and you like the post-it notes because it doesn't give you much space. That's right. So you can't write a paragraph. <laughs> you can't put your nope. fancy graph. That's right. You got to just mm -hmm. jot it down. You get this collection of post-it notes and now you're starting to subtract the ones that are repetitive, yep. the ones that are just not very helpful. Yes. And you have your bullets. Now you're like, okay, how do I assemble this into an actual story that is compelling? Yes. What's and, great about it, it's almost like a storyboard. It is like a storyboard. It's, you know, it just goes back to this editing idea. How yes. many shots do you have are, that are redundant, that are not adding? And if they're not adding, it's possible that they're, they're right. taken and, away. And, you know, when you film stuff, you connect 
scenes and ideas that you're like, you thought those scenes needed to go together. And you're like, yeah, we don't really need that one. Technically we could fill this gap. And that's what it forces people to do. Cause you might end up in the book and it's sort of like, it's a little bit of a reveal here, but I do tell people, Hey, you're going to start with 25 bullet points, but then I get them up to like 50 or more because I have exercises that get them out of your brain. The ones you didn't think of. Cause what I want them to do is look at it and be like, Oh crap, I can't say all this. And it's like, yeah, I know that's the point. Like you can't say all this. Let's start figuring out what you're supposed to say. And now they realize, okay, like if I'm going to put it into these categories, like where do I put them? What things are the most important? Cause then you're like, and then, you know, as you know, like I have this cool test where it's like, Hey, if the fire alarm went off, couple minutes into your pitch have you said the most important things or are you thinking you're m night Shyamalan waiting right. for this big six cents <laughs> moment at the end where you reveal the value like that doesn't work you know yeah but then their assistants have come in again yeah. they're placing their they're lunch order they and this happened them. this literally happened to me at mtv i had brian graden in the room as the president of the network i was pitching a show and burr, the fire alarm went off <laughs> and you know what it's like in an office everybody sits there and be like why well, is the fire alarm going off like but then it was like hey uh no, Over I actually here. think we have to actually evacuate. And somebody came in and said, hey, they're, they're making us evacuate. Crap. So we go out and there's a thousand people in the parking lot <laughs> and they finally clear the, the, the parking lot. Okay, you guys go back in the building. Guess what? Brian Graydon didn't come back to that meeting. And I didn't say enough in those first minutes to get the pitch across. Like there was so much I wanted to say and like I ruined that chance because I didn't give him enough to make him go, oh, hey, I'm going to come back to this meeting. And I certainly didn't give him enough to say like, oh, I don't need to go back because I, I already have it in my brain. And that's where I started to develop like, hey, this is a good exercise because if you can't do that, you're toast because the assistant will come in and screw your pitch. Somebody will ask a wild <laughs> question. The cell phone will ring. You got to get those first things in place. So what is this WAC acronym? Yeah. And so how do we put this all together? Uh, it's a good one. It's, it stands for, it's an acronym. WAC is W-H-A-C. That's the spelling. And it's what is it? How does it work? Are you sure? And can you do it? And when you have your statements of value, you put them in that order because that's the order that you're going to explain the information. Uh, and here's the easiest way to understand it. When someone's trying to pitch or present or tell you a story or do anything, any kind of interaction, and they're trying to explain something to you, how many times in your brain have you been going, oh my God, could you just tell me what this is? Like, oh, oh, okay, just what, how does it work? Like, could you just tell me how this is and like what it is and how it works? Like your brain naturally wants those two things solved absolutely first. What is it? How does it work? And so in the WAC method, it's like, okay, all your statements, which are the ones that tell people what it is on the simplest plane? What are the ones that tell you how it works? Like literally, how does it work? How do you do this? Okay, once we got those two things, now your audience has conceptualized it and that's important. Now they're gonna be like, okay, does it really work that way? Like, are you sure you can actually do that? Um, does this make sense? Like, wait, aren't there laws against that? Or like, well, wait, I thought I, I thought there's only four of those in existence. Like then someone's like, okay, I understand it, but now I want to verify in there. And that's where you use your facts, figures, logic, reason that basically say, yeah, the, you know, there was a law passed last week, or we actually have 42 in stock or whatever it is that says these are the validation of how it works and what it is. Right. And then the last piece is like, can you do it? Meaning like, okay, well, what does it cost? Uh, okay, when can I get it delivered? Okay, well, what's the next step for us to work together? Or, okay, I want you to meet the boss. Or this doesn't work for me. Or, you know what I mean? This, I'm not the right person you should be pitching to. What, whatever that last piece is, that's where they're going with actualization. Like, okay, I understand it. I believe it. Now I got to decide if I'm going to actualize this. What's my next step of action? And that's, that's really the flow of anybody's rationalization story. And so all you want to do is lay it out in that format and people will start to understand it and respond the way you hope they do. And in today's day and age, very, very rarely are we in a situation where we're just pitching one decision maker and boom, checks oh open mm -hmm. and <laughs> we're, I mean. we're after it. How do you tailor your pitch for a committee where you know there's going to be legal, there's going to be right. marketing, there's going to be a decision bunch of Decision by people. committee is, I say decision by committee, and I'm telling you in any language, I hear the same groans. Like, I will have it's an audience by committee. just, just Everyone's like, like oh, because no. that's the way the world is, right? So you got to understand how we make decisions. Like, we, we do what's called a, the rationalization story. So every decision we make, and we're the only species that does this, we rationalize. 
So what you're gonna have for lunch today, you know, why you chose this office, why people kill their wives, why we go to war. It doesn't matter what it is, why you're gonna cheat on your best friends with his wife. Like all of the bad decisions, we rationalize them so that we live with them. We understand them and we've made that decision. <laughs> and it's a great exercise um, to, if you think about a big decision, let's say, the car you drive, which is funny because I did this in New York and I forgot people don't drive cars. <laughs> so I'm asking about the car they drive. But if you think about the car you drive and I ask you simply, why did you choose that car? And you say it to yourself and then you go a couple layers deeper. Okay, so but why is that important? Why did you choose it that way? Why is that the most important thing? Why is, do you value that? You build a dozen sentences and you do that for five or six questions. If you listen to what you just said to yourself, like there's no adjectives or adverbs in there. It's the simplest version of your explanation for the, one of the biggest like financial decisions of your life. You've just explained it to yourself in super simple terms with the most valuable thing right up front. And then the explanation of those things as you go, that's called the rationalization story. And if you can make someone else feel the same about your story, if you can mimic your pitch to the way they will rationalize it, they have a really good chance of explaining it to somebody else. And so if you're dealing with decision by committee or death by committee, what you want to do is give them the ammunition to answer the question. Hey, why did you like that? Why did you invest in that? Why did you want to buy this? Why should we get involved? Why are we talking about this today? Because they have to answer it. And if you can give them the what is it, how it works, are you sure, and can you do it, they will take their, their committee through the same rationalization process. And here's what's great. If you do it right, they don't have to put themselves on the line because that's the death by committee, is no one is gonna stand up and be like, oh my God, I saw it, it was so amazing, it's gonna fundamentally change our company. Here's what it was. Because somebody in that committee will be like, fundamentally change our company? What are you talking about? I hate that idea. <laughs> so what they've learned to do is, um, so guys, so I got this pitch the other day, and I mean, I don't know, it might be okay, I don't know, I wasn't really sure, but I wanted to find out what you guys thought. Like, um, I mean, it wasn't great, I mean, who, you know, but maybe it was, I don't know. Let's talk about it. here's what it was, well, it was kind of like that, and then they hear somebody be like, oh, I don't get it, oh, I didn't get it either. That was my thing, yeah, I don't think it's a great idea. Like, right? I mean, how many times do you know that happens to whatever it was? Plenty. Yeah, yeah no plenty. one wants to stick their neck out like And by that. the way, I watched it happen to one of my TV shows. I actually, like, the president of the network brought me into a, the room of the green light meeting, which n producers never get in, because he couldn't explain the show and he found it was going away and I happened to be in, waiting for him downstairs. And I watched people, marketing people, press, whatever these people were, deputies to deputies of assistants or whatever, and they just poked holes in everything. And they're mean. And they're unhelpful and they're just, they just seem like nasty people. That's what I felt like, because it was my idea. And you guys were saying mean things about it, right? <laughs> and I realized like, if I wasn't in that room, this thing was dead. And so if you give people the information in a way that they can re re relay it without having to put themselves on the line, that's the best chance you're gonna get. Because they can be like, oh yeah, I saw this thing. Here's what it is, and here's how it works. Uh, they do have this connected. They actually got regulatory approval, and we can have it here in six months. They don't have to say, I think it's great, or I was so impressed, or like, this is gonna make us $10 million, or here's the, you know, we should definitely hire this company. They don't have to say any of that. They just have to give the information because you've given them those weapons. And that's how you survive that committee. Now, of course, when we're starting out and we love our idea, yeah. and we're so excited to share it with people, there are a lot of misconceptions when it comes to pitching. A lot of us have these visualizations of fireworks and this is gonna be amazing and I'm gonna have this crazy PowerPoint. What are those <laughs> misconceptions that you dispel with your clients all the time? Um, I think the first one, is, well, there's two big ones. One is passion. There is just this blanket understanding that you have to be passionate about your pitch. And if you don't have passion, you're never gonna get there, which is somewhat true, but really dangerous because passion isn't a blanket. Right? You don't throw it over everything. Because when you're trying to be passionate about something, you end up right on the line of making it about you and not the idea. And if you make it about you, that means people are gonna start judging you more than the idea. And that's a really dangerous place to be because what you end up doing a lot of times is going into promotional. Passionate is one thing, promotion is a different thing. And when people sense you being promotional, right. it's like, mm, you're dead. And so it's a tightrope you walk. And what I explain to people is, the greater your desire to achieve your outcome, the more likely you will turn passion into promotion. 
because you really need them to buy in. And you've bought it and so much. And so the greater your desire for them to buy in, the more likely you will say anything you need to to make that happen. And today people will pick up on that. So what I try to explain to people is be passionate about your facts, not your opinions. When you're passionate about your opinions, people will judge you. When you're passionate about your facts, they understand why you're passionate. They may not share it, but they understand it. And I've had so many people come into my office to pitch me a TV show and it's a terrible idea. Now that happens every day, right? I've pitched bad ideas, but they're so passionate about it, about how it's going to be amazing and how it's going to be a hit and like advertisers are going to be in it. They're so passionate about the bad idea that it's like, okay, it's a bad idea. And then I tell my assistant, I don't ever want them in my office again because they don't understand the process. And I was never like that. I was never like that in the network meeting saying, oh my God, this is amazing. This is such an amazing idea. I wasn't like, it was like, hey, I've got an idea. Here's what it is. And it's like the parts that are factual that you can't start the sentence with I think or in my opinion. If you can start a sentence with that, you need to tone it right down. Because it's like, in my opinion, I think this is going to be really good. Is okay. But oh my God, this is going to be so amazing. Does not help your cause. Right. And I've noticed, uh, obviously, watching Shark Tank, which is the ultimate right. pitch. Yeah. In, in the book talks about this. The pitches are about three minutes. That's what our attention span mm, is. It's the editing and mantra. And oftentimes, people get too bogged down in these big numbers and trying to prove to the right. sharks that there's this market because they drew these fancy yep. numbers. And there's five billion people on this planet. So, therefore, this is a hit. Right. And that doesn't work. No. Because I don't need that information yet. I don't need the 5 billion number yet. If I have all of the information, then I might be interested like, oh, the market share is that big? Like, okay, that's some relevance, right? And what you'll find is, Shark Tank's a perfect example, is that people will feel like you've watched it, good idea, and then right at the end they go, well, sharks, who wants to dive in with me? And you're like, you can see Mark Cuban go like, oh, God. Like, they roll their eyes because it's like, oh, right, this is a pitch. Yeah, I forgot. You've rehearsed this 500 times in the mirror and you're pitching everybody you know. Like, it pulls people out of the story, right? And you just don't need to do that. You don't need an ending. You don't need a fancy closing. You don't need to perform. It, it's just not necessary right now. Like, if you lead your audience, they will get there. They'll want more from you. That's what they do. Now, how do you approach follow up? Well, just to, to go along with that, when I, I, I've seen several episodes of Shark Tank, but there's. There's obviously certain pitches that still stick out in my mind. And one of them was this on its, in its value was a really silly, stupid idea. It was a guy who drew, who draws people, custom cat pictures. That was it. That was, that was his, his company. Right. And Mark bought it like that because when I, when I look at whack, Right? What is it? Why well, draw people custom cat pictures? Right. Uh, how does it work? Well, you you send me a picture, or you tell me what you want, and I and I draw it. And then it was, well, how do we? Are ha- you sure? Is like, well, do they even look good? Like, are they interesting pictures? Yeah. How many of you've you, sold already? Right. Or I show you a picture, you're like, oh wow, well, that is kind of cool. And right? and uh, how was he going to make it work? Well, it, it turns out that he was great with SEO, so he was able to get a lot of traffic to this thing, and people bought. And Mark was like, that was it. That was it was over, right? And that and that silly thing, and you you see some incredible stuff on that yeah. show, but that it's not always the most incredible products that are going to get no. And I've, and I've seen Shark Tank episodes where the guy screwed up the pitch so badly that I went to go try to find the product because <laughs> it's like I could I was like that's a good product, but you you messed it up so badly that it's nobody bought it and it's nowhere. And it's like I remember thinking that like that poor guy, and I remember him shaking and he was nervous, and I was just like, oh man. That was a really great product. The fact that I remember that, and I've even looked this up, and I must have seen that seven years ago. Oh, I yeah. can't even remember. And there's the website. Yeah. As seen on Shark Tank. <laughs> Still I was like, cranking wow. out cat pictures. That's right. Because, again, like, there's a lot of questions about cat pictures and the marketability and all that kind of stuff. But to get to those questions and to have those answers be really valuable and impactful, you kind of need the preamble set. Mm. Like now you and I could have a real cat picture business conversation because <laughs> I know exactly what it is, how yeah. it works. I'm, I'm sure of it because I've seen a cat picture now. I've seen it and <laughs> I know how he does it. Okay, now we can really get into the nuances of it and if our business is going to invest or if we're, we're a competing cat picture company, do we want to buy? Like 
I get it. Like now we get it. And that's why that resonated. And again, you didn't need to do a lot more. Right. Like, and what you talk about in the book, and I think this is an important uh, sidebar for our audience is, you know, nervousness is okay. If, if you actually dial in whack Mm. and you can share the relevant information, we will look beyond the nerves and we're expecting nerves. So I think a lot of us get bogged down in like, oh my God, I'm so terrified to share this. Oh, and yeah. oh, that went terribly. But listen, if you nail this, if you nail the first three minutes in the whack, you could be shaking and you tell a story in the book yes. about mm. a scientist actually, on stage. If I had to pick one way or the other, I'd be like, I'd rather you stumble and nervous and sweat through your, your clothes than be a guy, hey, how right, are you? Too like, slick. Yeah, because there's actually, it's, and it's gonna get, it's gonna get more in the future because I can see the swinging, is that if you're really bad at pitching and you're like stumbling, I might believe that you haven't pitched this very much or that I might have an opportunity here that you might not no have. No one else no, knows Somebody about. else might not have seen this because you're kind of a dud and like you're annoying. And so this might be an opportunity. And I always used to make the joke about Canadians coming to Los Angeles <laughs> as I'm a Canadian. I was like, hey, like when I first came here, the idea that I had you know, a script and I had ideas, people genuinely thought, well, well, he's a Canadian. No one's ever probably heard these things before. They could actually be good. Whereas like if you were a native person from Los Angeles, it'd be like, well, if your script was any good, somebody would have read it by now. Right. And so it's like, if you're terrible at pitching and awkward as hell, there's a chance people will start to think like, Oh wow, he's probably hasn't got very good meetings. This could be a real opportunity. Right. Because, and then if you are, I bet you'll do the work. I bet your whack method. and I bet your pitch is, is dialed in perfectly. Cause I have seen that with my own eyes. I have seen people who are, absolutely unbearable personalities just awful but when they get the information right it's like oh wow they are not expecting people to like them or to be drawn to them or want to listen to them past those three minutes and it's like it's so much more powerful because it's just the information so it was it's amazing now obviously when we're talking about death by committee there's a follow-up involved yeah. to any pitch. Yeah. And we talked about the likelihood of them just going, Oh, great idea. Boom. Let's move. Here's yeah. resources, whatever it is. How do you approach follow up? Especially for those of us who are a little newer in our career, who don't really have a name or a network yet. Yeah. You know, it's hard because that is a fine line. Like it's not just the simplicity of that that's like, sometimes people need to be pushed a little bit. The problem is, is follow up has always been connected with closing and closing has been taught. And it's a terrible thing because will tell your audience that there's a string attached. If I need to do this right now, there's a problem. And I make the joke where it's like, I don't do anything without checking Amazon reviews. Like, even if it's something that's not on Amazon or it's not a product, whatever, like, it, what's the weather today? I don't know, I gotta check an Amazon review. Like, my world is like, surround, yeah. and everybody's in that mode, right? So I'll go back to my Gordon Ramsay example. Like, if I had Gordon Ramsay to cater your wedding, but I put a sheet of paper in front of you and said, but you gotta sign it right now. All of a sudden, our conversation changes. And now you're like, oh, wait a second. Like, well, how long is Gordon going to be there? Or like, is it, 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 it's the Gordon Ramsay, right? And like, well, do you have him committed to you? Like, is it a, like, did he sign? Like, what happens if he cancels? All of a sudden, everything changes, right? So follow up if you, if you separate it from closing, because there is no closing. Like, people will close themselves or they won't. They already know you pushing is not going to help. And the, mm-hmm. and the customers that you could push to close, there's not enough of them out there to warrant the kind of time and energy that you're going to be putting into it. And on the flip side, they oftentimes are terrible customers. Oh my God. It's, if you've had to push them that yeah, hard to the decision, that skepticism doesn't stop no. after they've paid you. In yeah. fact, it's even more heightened and they're like, I'm ready for a refund. You didn't yes. deliver. So I always go with the idea of like reminder and asks. And that's about it. Like, Hey, just reminding you next week, I'm going to be moving this, whatever. Did you want to do it? Like once you ask, you know, you know, Right? Like, it's like, I, and, I, and I won't share who it is, but I have a very good friend who has a popular media thing that I wanted to get on. I wanted to get on his show. And we talk quite a bit on text. And I have asked twice. <laughs> and he responded to a lot of other things in my text, but not, can I get on your show? And so it's like, yeah, I could call my publicist. I could call his manager. I could get our agents involved. But it's like, I already know the answer. I'm not big enough for his show. And he doesn't want to tell me that. He doesn't want to say it. He's not man enough to just have the conversation with me. Fine. I get it. But in, in my heart, like I kind of want to ask and push for the no, like, but 
I, I know, I know, I knew the first time he didn't respond to that text that he was leery to it. The second time, I know he's avoiding it. We so have, you know that. We have that, that want and that need to close that loop. Right. But it's Dude, a lot the loop's of, closed. You know it's closed, <laughs> it's closed. It's fine. And, and if you keep seven, pushing, yeah, you, no, you push people away. Yeah, and there's no coming back from that. And like, it just doesn't make any sense, right? And I'm working with, um, big Las Vegas entertainment group and they have a tech, a timeshare uh, company and they're really struggling because the, the audience for timeshares isn't changing from a traveler perspective, but it's the people that, that will succumb to that emotional buy in the moment, right? A timeshare needs you to get you on the property, get you all drunk and high and happy, and then have you sign on the dotted line right now, kind of without reading things, right? Like that's kind of the way the sales process has gone. Like, they have to close you on the phone. You can't go research it. And it's like, hey, nobody buys like that anymore. And the people that you can get to buy like that are are, are aging out and there's <laughs> few of them of their, like you can't run a business like that. And so for us to go through the process and be like, hey, you guys are gonna have to come up with value. Like surprise, surprise, timeshares do have value to a very large part of the population. You just gotta find those people and you gotta qualify them and like you gotta give them the value so they feel like I'm seeing it all you won't need to close them the same way. Like they'll be like, great. I do travel this much. I do have kids. I would like to know what my vacation plans will be for the next nine years. I don't want to have to worry about budgets. I don't want to be like, okay, this works for you. And it's a brilliant idea, but that's lost. And so closing and follow up. If you start mixing those things together, people are like, urge, urge, alarm bells. And trusting your intuition on it. I feel yeah. like we all have you know that, it. You know, the loop's closed. Sense. You know, you know if they're going to close or not. You know it. So just, and you know, and you're better off, you're better off to pitch a hundred times getting the no's as fast as you can because then you're going to get to the yeses as opposed to chasing the maybes and maybe you convert one. But it's like the amount of energy that you put into those maybes is just not worth it. And once you get, by the way, once your pitch gets faster and, and more efficient and, and simpler in that sense, like you'll be able to get it out more. You'll be able to happy about it. You'll feel more confident. You'll get to more people. They'll respond better. Like you won't even be chasing the maybes. You won't need it. Now, is this something you do with family and friends? Oh, all the time. Are family and friends doing it on you? Yes. My son does it <laughs> all the time. My wife's better at it. And you'll also find that I like you get better at hearing people's value. Like I can hear your statements of value so fast now that even when I'm talking to my friends and relatives, like I can hear what they're trying to say and I want to stop them and be like, just stop talking. I've got it like <laughs> all the time. Right. But my son knows how to do it now because he's figured it out where it's like, you know what dad wants? He just wants the information. So he just comes in, dad, here's what I need. Here's why I want to do it. Here's what the protect, like, here's why it's going to work out. Okay. Like if he wants to borrow my car, I have a really cool old muscle car. And he's just like, here's where I want to take it. Here's why it's important to me to take this car as opposed to drive my car or a different car. Here's the reason why, you know, it's going to be okay because I've done this, this and this in the past. I've never let you down. And it's like, you're not going to be using it. Like what he knows. And it's just like, Arr. I could say no just for the sake of saying no, but like, I don't really have a good excuse to say no. I could say, Oh, I don't want you driving my car, but it's like, that's not going to work. He's driven it before. So he knows that brilliantly. And I, I've watched my wife do it with my, my parents, her in-laws, like trying to convince them of something. She's just like, okay, I'm not going to get emotional. I'm not going to get off track. I'm just going to like, here's what we want to do for vacation this year. Here's what we want you to be there. Like, and it's just like, yeah, it's like, it's so much better. There's all these little skills that we tend to use all the time. We don't really know that they can be developed. Yeah. Storytelling is one of those things. We're all selling. We're all, uh, we're always uh, pitching as well. And, and last month, our topic that we sat on and uh, and went into was storytelling right and i know that you had some insights on where to insert a good story around this for your yeah pitch. um and because a lot of people think of storytelling in that in a sort of like literal sense as in i went here and then i did this right and that's fine that is obviously a story but storytelling is really the process of sort of like a breadcrumb trail of information that people can follow somewhere they, they follow your build of your character. They follow the, the value of your product. Whatever they're following piece by piece, that's how storytelling is done. And so the place where it really makes a lot of sense is I use what's called the reason for being, the opening. Like a lot of people ask, how do you open a pitch? And it's like, yeah, the small talk, blah, blah, blah. But the, the best way to open a pitch is the story of how you came to be involved with it. 
when did you think this was going to be a good idea? Not claiming, oh my God, I've got something amazing for you, but just like, when did this happen to you? Like how, if you're sitting here going to pitch or present something to someone, you've gone through a process that made you believe in it enough to have you sitting in this chair. So there's got to be a reason. And there's usually a story there that sets up that reason for being. And it's what, you know, and I explained from a Hollywood side, like there's a reason why Bambi's mom dies at the beginning of the movie. <laughs> it's not relevant to the story of Bambi. It doesn't have anything to do with the, that piece. It didn't have to happen then, but it does have to happen then to tell Bambi's story in a sense, because it sets up your reason for being. Here's why Bambi's alone. Here's why you should care. And that's kind of the setup. Like, what's your Bambi story? Like, how did you get here? Okay, now I know this is how I want you to feel. And here we go. Like, you know what's coming and you're like, okay. And you set the tone for that, right? And that's a great story. And then I usually try to have people do what's called the callback. Like, if you've ever watched a stand-up comedian, you know that they, there's a joke in the beginning that somehow they're bringing back where they use that punchline again and it's good for a laugh and they're really good at that. Whereas it's a little more subtle in movies and stuff, but there's always that callback, which is like, if the reason for being in the opening is why you thought it was good or when you believed it was gonna be something good, what's the story of when you knew it was good? What's right. the story of when you realized, oh wow, this really does work. Right? I have to tell someone. Yeah, I have and, to share this. Right, yeah. or like the first time it really like, resonated or you hit a sales goal or something that says, oh my God, I'm really on to something. So those two stories kind of bookend in there and they really do well. Cause you tell the story of how we got here and how this is. And then I tell you what it is and how it works. And I show you some of the details and then I'll be like, and now you can see it, right? Like now I knew I had it. And that, that for me is that aha moment. It's like, like you almost want to say to people like, you see, you see what I'm saying? Like you understand, right? Like that's where that story helps, where you realize that it happened, that there was something there. And that piece is when you learn to use that breadcrumb trail style, you can make almost anything compelling. You can make anybody listen if you do it right. If you just lead them in pieces, that's the way we want information. Well, I think that initial story too, instead of you coming in as like this all-knowing expert and I, right. I'm i smarter than you, it really puts you in the, the shoes of the person who's about to receive the pitch of yeah. like, I didn't even know this was a thing either. Right. Check out this discovery yeah. that I'm so excited. Yeah, and it's like, oh, okay. And you can do it, like, again, the story isn't about the quality of the story or the details, it's really about the, the format. And if I told you the story of how I came here this morning, right? Like, I get out in my car, but it had been raining, and so there was drops all over the windows, right? So I had to, I had to look for my windshield wipers, but I live in Los Angeles, so it's like, where are my windshield exactly. wipers, right? <laughs> so I had to turn the windshield wipers, and then, I'm, you know, there's a canyon from my house, so I can't make a call, and I wanna call my assistant and get details on the address, so I gotta wait, but then I, then I get a call as soon as I get out of the canyon. So now I'm coming up to that part at the 405 and the 170 like, or the five where it's like, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to be going down the 405 or the 170 and I'm trying to get this person off the phone, but you know, they're talking a lot. So I'm getting nervous. So I have to make a 50, 50 decision. Now, listen, I could keep going. Nothing happened on the way down here. There was really nothing interesting, but it's like, it's, it's one thing after another. My thoughts are clear. I'm not like, oh, and this happened. Oh, but, oh yeah, but I forgot this. Oh, and then she does this over there. Oh, and then my assistant, but she does over here. Oh yeah, but my assistant, but she doesn't live in, in at my house. Like, I don't, I'm not clouding it. I'm just like, this happened, and then this happened, and that led to this, and then this happened, and then this happened. And that's the, that's the classic storytelling formula. It's not sexy. It's not interesting. One of my, one of my mentors was one of the greatest Hollywood writers of all time, Stephen J. Cannell, and like, he couldn't write sexy or like overly subtle or interesting to save his life. Like he did the A team and, and like, <laughs> it's just the straightforward as it gets. Like, and yeah, there's a Quentin Tarantino out there that does this wild storytelling technique. And, but there's really only one other two of those guys, you know, like, and, and for every loss that becomes a huge hit, that's all over the place. Like there's thousands of episodes of CSI or NCIS or these shows that never fail to deliver. And like, you want to be try to be the Quentin Tarantino of pitching your idea? Okay, that's not a really great idea, I don't think. But, <laughs> right. You know, that and then story. This happened, and then this happened, and then it went here. Is like that's what we're trained to do. We build information that way. And it's easy to follow along. It's, it's easy. It's a to straight follow. line shot, yeah. much like the pitch. The story has to be the same. Yeah. Or we're already thinking about lunch. It's it's breadcrumbs, and if you start with breadcrumbs and feed it piece by piece, at some point the person's gonna be like, "Holy shit, I just ate lunch." You know what I mean? Like that's the, I'm not going to use that later. I'm going to use that on stage. That's a good one. Oh my God. 
Actually, before you go, we love to give I'm here our often audience. I'm leaving. This is fantastic. <laughs> I love this. We love to give our audience a challenge. You have a great challenge in the book called the telephone test. Yes. Can you share it with our audience great for one. this week's challenge? Only if they promise to do it because I have people that promise to do it and then I know they don't because it's a little bit of a pain in the ass. So what's your social handle and they will hit you up okay. and let you know. That's right. I, I'm at Brant Penvidic on any of the handles. You, I will help guide you through this because it's really valuable. What you do in the telephone test, the same as that telephone game that you used to play. I whisper to you, you whisper to him, he whispers to him, they whisper to her, and you see what comes back, right? You take your picture presentation, you call somebody that doesn't really know you that well, or wouldn't know, and you give them the pitch, unadulterated, just square on its own, and you say, I need you to call somebody, pitch it to them, have them call somebody else, and then have them call one more person, and here's the number to call me back, right? And you may actually have to like, uh, and we use, I do it with clients, like buy Starbucks gift card. I'll give you a $10 <laughs> gift card if you can do this. Everybody who calls, you know, whatever you gotta do, but you gotta make them do the three or four layers. You can't have them call somebody and then, then call you back because it's gonna be a false positive. You need at least three layers. What you're gonna find is what comes back to you on that phone call, because it's gonna be someone that you don't even know, and they're gonna be like, uh, okay, I'm supposed to call this number and pitch this idea thing that I heard. And you're like, okay, great. And I'm telling you what comes back is going to make you very uncomfortable because you'd be like, what are you talking about? That is not, <laughs> not it at all, right? <laughs> so then you go do it again. And what you're going to find is, first of all, the stranger that calls you, whatever information they're saying back, that's what's resonating. So some things are like, oh, Don't wow, okay. It. They really like that part or that's, that obviously resonates where they remember that. But this was something I really wanted them to remember. Why didn't they? Let me see if I move it up in the process. Maybe that's more valuable than I thought or maybe it's not something I need. You go back to your whack and you see that. If I promise you, if you do that telephone test three times, three different times with different people, which again, it could take you all day to do, the value of what comes back and what you'll feel like when that phone rings and it's someone you don't know and they pitch back your idea, the way it went out, you will feel like you won the Super Bowl. <laughs> I have been in conference meetings with scientists that are jumping up and down, like splashing water on each other, like high-fiving, freaking out because we've been sitting in a conference room waiting for the phone call to come back. And we spent $400 on gift cards to try to get people to do it. <laughs> and it's just such a powerful exercise. And like, again, it's easy right. to not do it, but man, the value of it is, is it's world-class value. For and that's just a few what hours happens before. with your idea. Yeah. It's, By the way, it's battle testing. I got news it. for you. That's what happens. It's just they're not calling you back. Right. When they do call you back, they don't pitch the idea back. They just go, yeah, it's not for us. Or like, oh, they said no, right? Like, that's what's happening out there. Very good point. I'm going to use that too, by the way. And, and with your thoughts on practicing the pitch, is there a, a guideline you have, a threshold for yourself? Obviously, the telephone test is fantastic. Yeah. Uh, that you know, okay, this is ready for me to go in that room. I mean, it's once you get that, like if you get the telephone test back, you're ready and you can try it out. And I, and like I always tell people like, Hey, it's, it's three minutes. You should be trying out on a lot of people. And the, you know, the one thing you'll probably find is people interrupt you and they say like, Oh, what about this? Or how did this go? And it's like, Oh wait, I'm getting to that in a minute. Okay. That's when you know one of two things. Cause I've now learned there are some other options than just, you don't have it in the right order. You could be pitching an idiot. It does happen. I've had it happen in TV many, many times. <laughs> where it's like, okay, you're just a moron and you just want to jibber jabber. You're not really interested. I have had that happen enough to me. And I think I'm pretty good at this. So I'm like, okay, so I'll give you a pass. If that happens and you're genuinely pitching an idiot, that can happen. But most times it's because your breadcrumbs are not quite in the order. And they get to the end of the breadcrumb line. And they go, wait, I'm still hungry. And you're like, wait, 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 I got more breadcrumbs over you. And so it helps you do that. When you feel like you can get through it, confidently you're ready to unleash it because the downside is really small if you have something elaborate that you've built this whole performance the downside is big when you get it wrong if you're just talking information your information is not going to change that much no matter how many times you rehearse it not much bad can happen if the person understands it there doesn't matter how many times you explain it or how well you explain it if they understand it they understand it now it's yes or no like and that that's really where you want to be thank you so much for joining us oh, man, this has been a lot of fun I love this. You guys are fantastic. Where can our audience find more about you and how to work with you? Yeah, I'm easy to find at Brant Pinvidic on any of the social stuff. Or you can always go to the three minute rule .com and connect to me there. I love talking to people. I'll respond to anything you send me as long as it's less than three minutes. <laughs> I always say. Um, but I, I love interacting with people and it's just like, 
it's that time in my life where I'm like, ooh, I'm not making widgets anymore like TV was for me. It's like I get to interact with different people doing different things. People are really passionate about their stuff. There's a genuine frustration they have. And it's like unlocking that for people is, is a little addictive. So I'm, I'm totally into it. And that's what I loved about the book, the stories of all these different industries yeah, and your ability wild, to right? unlock it and the simple tools in the book that allow yeah. you to take that idea and get it out there. Yeah, I'm having a blast. So. Thank you so much. Absolutely, right. guys. But I feel alive